Hi there, and welcome to today's lecture. Uh, we're going to be discussing professionalism. And as we begin, uh, I want you to ask yourself, what is professionalism? I want you to take a second, press pause on the lecture, and ask yourself, what does it mean for you to practice professionalism in your life? And then come back to our lecture. If we look at the Webster's definition of professionalism, it really isn't a good definition in my opinion because it really doesn't tell us anything. It just says that professionalism is the competence or skill expected of a professional. So in this regard, we have to understand, well, what is a professional in order to uh, to better define professionalism? And that's something that we're going to do over the uh, duration of today's lecture. So if we think about professionalism, I want you to think about it not as something that we say, but I want you to think about it as an action. So if you were to go around and, you, and say, you know what, I, I am so professional at work. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean for you to be professional? What does it mean for you to practice professionalism um, at, uh, in your work? So I want you to think about that as an action. I love this quote here from Tomislav Sola, who says that professionalism is like love. It's made up of the constant flow of little bits of proof that testify to devotion and care. So what he's saying here is that, you know what, professionalism isn't just one thing. We can't define it uh, as as solely being one item, uh, that in fact, that professionalism is a lot of things that we can do and say in both our, our behavior and our interactions with other people that, that testify to the fact that we are professionals, that we are practicing professionalism. Now, we oftentimes and, and most often think of professionalism as something that uh, we apply to our, our professional careers, so our jobs. What is it that we're doing in that to be professionals um, or to practice professionalism at work? But we also see professionalism in other aspects of our lives. For instance, as a student, you're watching this lecture. Well, what are the things that make you a professional? in terms of being a student. What are elements of professionalism that testify, little bits of proof that testify to devotion and care um, as a student? Well, you show up to class on time and you're prepared, so you've done the readings or you've looked over the material for that, uh, for that day's lecture. You make eye contact, you listen intently as your professor goes through the lecture. You're not on your phone or on your computer the entire time. You raise your hand and provide questions or feedback. You answer questions if the professor asks. You also engage with other students in the class and you help them um, answer questions or in group work or things like that. You don't say, right, I'm a, I'm a professional student or I'm so professional as a student. It's your actions that show that to the professor. And that uh, feeds into this idea that professional is not a label that we give ourselves. Rather, it's a description that we hope other people apply to us. So you wouldn't tell your teacher, you know what, I am, I am, I am such a professional student. I practice professionalism. I'm such a good student. No, your actions will speak that by the fact that you're on time, you show up, you study, you complete your assignments and you complete them on time and you pass your exams and you do well. Those are the things that will say to your professor, you know what, this is a good student. So it is not a label we give ourselves. It's something we hope people apply to us. So why do we study professionalism? Why does it matter, especially in the context of business and professional communication? Well, you probably want a, a job or you want a better job or a better career in the future. And so professionalism, when we look at it from terms of um, co professional communication and how employers and organizations look at it, well, 96% of human resource managers believe that professionalism relates to the person and not the job title. Right? So it is skills that we bring to the table. They're not inherent to any position 
our company. 92% believe that colleges and universities should develop professionalism in students regardless of the field of study. So they think that it's something that students aren't well prepared in. 51% believe that the sense uh, that there is a sense of entitlement that has increased among employees, meaning that employees just think that they are entitled to certain things, uh, that they don't have to be professional uh, in the workplace, that things just they're just entitled. And that's a bad idea. 96% report that a job applicant's professionalism affects their likelihood of being hired. So do you come across as being professional in your job interview? And if the answer to that is no, then you're probably not going to get the job, according to 96% of these managers who were interviewed. Also, we can look at some examples of characteristics of today's professionals and see that these are the things that employers say um, are, are good skills or that the percentage of employees possess. 34 uh, percent have good interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills being how they interact with other people both um, at work and maybe clients or customers of the organization. They say that in order for someone to be professional, 21% say that they value time management. We're gonna talk about some of these in more detail. 25% look at the communication skills. 9% look at the knowledge base of that person to say in order for someone to be professional, they have to be really knowledgeable about their field or industry um, and they have to keep that up and maintain it. 25% uh, focus on appearance as being an important factor. 27% work ethic, how we work and the practices that we follow. And then you'll see some things here in terms of uh, employers saying IT misuse on the job, that 83% of employees have an excessive use of social media. 82% text message at inappropriate times, 78% use inappropriate use of the internet, 65% engage in excessive personal cell phone usage, and 8% unauthorized access of company files. That's pretty remarkable when you look at some of these characteristics of today's professional. Now, as we move forward, one of the easiest ways uh, to look at professionalism, uh, which is why we're going to start with this, is when we think about people in authority, our people that we trust. And there is no better example of this than to look at our doctors, a doctor or a nurse. These are individuals that we feel we need to trust. And we're not going to go to a doctor that we don't trust, or, or you shouldn't. Right? If a doctor comes back and tells you something and you, and you don't trust them, then you're probably not going to take the medication. You're not going to change your lifestyle. You're not going to do anything differently. You're going to say, you know what, I don't really trust that person. And maybe you're going to get another opinion or maybe, uh, maybe you just don't go back to the doctor. So this is a perfect example. I love this. Right? It says, please wait while critical updates are installed. We want our doctors to know what they're doing. Right? You don't want your doctor to take you into the operating room and have to be on WebMD or Google you know, uh, doing a search on how to remove someone's appendix. Right? We want our doctors to, to, to know, to be knowledgeable. And so that shows us this element of professionalism. I recently saw this commercial um, and I think it is fantastic in regards to this. Have you ever worked for Dr. Francis? Oh yeah, he's okay. Just okay? Guess who just got reinstated? Well, not officially. Nervous? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. I'll see you in there. Just okay is not okay. It I love that. That's actually an AT&T commercial. But the premise behind that, just okay is not okay, that people in positions... Um, of authority uh, that we trust or have to trust with, with maybe our, our life even being at stake is um, we expect those people to contain, to have this element of professionalism. Now, one of the easiest things that we also look at is terms of appearance. And so we can look at appearance in terms of job interviews and say, just like that chart had showed earlier, if you show up for a job interview and you're in a pair of shorts, a tank top and some flip flops, you're probably not going to get that job unless maybe it's a summer position for 
a lifeguard position at a pool and you show up in that, maybe then they're not going to look at you and, and think that you're being unprofessional. But one of the first things that we use to, to cue ourselves in on if someone is a, is a professional or not, if they're being professional, is their appearance. Right, so if you have a flat tire on the interstate and you call your insurance company or AAA or you have some other car service and they show up and uh, that individual shows up in a suit, you're probably gonna be like, okay, well this is a little weird. You're showing up to change my tire in a suit, but if they, if they show up um, in regular clothes or what we would consider work clothes, we're not gonna think anything of it, right? If your waiter is dressed professionally, you're probably going to have a better image of the restaurant. You're going to think psychologically that the food is going to be better. If police officers or air pilots, air pilot, airline pilots are actually a great example of this. If you're like me, you, you get the chance to see who the pilot is. You get on an airplane. You, I automatically turn my head. I look in the cockpit and I try to see who is flying the plane right? I want to see what they look like. And in that instance, I judge, I create this mental image in my head and I ask myself, okay, well, do they look like they know what they're doing? Right? Because that matters to me. I, I get a little bit scared of flying. I've been all over the world, but it still makes me a little bit nervous because it's something that's out of my control. But I, I, I look and I gauge the pilot's effectiveness of flying the plane based off of personal image and how they look, how they're dressed, how they're presenting themselves. Now we can be faked out by that. It's not really the best example, but we use those things to help us all of the time as we uh, make assumptions about someone being professional or not. Right? There are expectations and standards in terms of how we should look in any given setting, and that's gonna depend on the job that you're in. So if you're working in a bank or working in the financial services industry like I was in, you're probably gonna be in a shirt and tie at a minimum every day. Now when I had meetings with, uh, major meetings with clients or customers, clients, customers, or other important individuals within the bank, I would throw on the blazer on top of that, right? I wanted to have that highest level of professionalism in terms of my appearance. So it's just gonna depend on where you're working. If you're working at Google or Apple or some other company, right? Or maybe you're the lifeguard at the summer pool, you're not gonna show up in a shirt and tie, but you need to know what those expectations and standards are for that position, for that company, and for that industry in general. Now, I wish there was a beginner's guide to mastering professionalism in the workplace. That would be really cool. And there probably are some good, um, some good literature and books out there. But I wanted to give you in today's lecture a brief rundown of um, some things that you can do to be professional in the workplace. I'm going to call these Dr. C's tips for professionalism. Now, I come from the professional world. I had a successful 10-plus uh, year career in the financial services industry. I've been both an employee and a sales manager. And so I've seen this from both uh, perspectives of uh, being an employee and then being an actual manager. And so um, it gives me a little bit of insight. So I want to give you some tips for professionalism. The number one thing that I can tell you in terms of uh, people's perception of you being a professional is to be on time and to be consistently on time. In fact, I would say be early, right? My tip would be be early. Uh, if you are late and you are late consistently, that is the easiest way to ruin your reputation uh, and to not be considered professional, right? It's the reason why punctuality matters. In the classroom, if a student shows up late over and over and over again, for me, that's disrespectful. It says that that student doesn't really care in order to be there on time like every other student in the classroom. At work, I same thing. As an employee, I understood it. You know, I would call in late sometimes. I would get up late. The alarm clock would go off. But you can't do that over and over again, right? You can do that sometimes because life does happen. Things things do come up. But you want to have that that um, the image of being a professional there. So you, when that happens and you call your boss, your boss is like, "Oh, I'm sorry to hear that things aren't going well this morning." You know, no, you know, take your time, get here when you can. I really appreciate you letting me know. And they genuinely mean that. 
versus the person who calls in late over and over and over and over again, you're probably going to be written up and you're not going to have a job very long. Uh, attendance and not being on time and not coming to work uh, is the number one reason why employees lose their job. The number one reason. I used to tell employees when I was a sales manager, I would say, you know, you're late consistently and they're like, well, traffic's really bad and yada, 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 excuse after excuse. And I would say, listen, you've got to be here. Just get up 10 minutes earlier. Leave 15 minutes earlier. If someone's not willing to do that and to make that commitment, then they're probably going to lose their job. There are some quotes out there that I really like that say showing up is like 80% of the battle. Um, I love this quote here. Show up in every single moment like you're meant to be there. So not only just show up, but show up with authority, show up eager and excited to be there, and it does make a difference. And then also like this, just keep showing up when most people would quit. Now, recently um, in the news, there's been um, government shutdowns and things like that, and you see where after a month, people just quit going to work, even though they were considered essential personnel. Right, where, the, where they said, you know what, you have to be here and you have to be here without pay. And people just didn't show up. People just quit going to work. Now, that might be an extreme, um, an extreme issue that's not going to infect or probably impact or affect you. But what I mean by this is sometimes just being there when everyone else is in a sour mood or doesn't want to be there, that can make a difference. In how you are perceived and your boss will remember that I made a mental note I knew the people who were there who were at work um, who came in early who stayed late etc your boss sees that right and that plays a part um, in their perception of you and this idea of if you're a professional or not well it doesn't mean you have to be early and stay late all the time but I'm what I'm saying is those things are noticed and they do make a difference now, I do want to talk about some things that maybe you don't think of right off the bat when you think about professionalism. When I asked you at the beginning of the lecture to press pause and to think about what what it means, excuse me, to be professional, you probably didn't think about personal hygiene. But this is something that comes up all the time in terms of um, issues with personal hygiene. What do you say to a coworker or someone you work with? Who has personal hygiene issues and to who do you say it to do you say it to them do you go to the boss who is it that you go to and talk to when there are issues of personal hygiene and this is something that comes up um, unfortunately it does come up at work uh, quite often uh, in people's professional careers and they just don't know what to say or what to do and so my advice to you is this what do you say well, and to whom? You don't say it to them. A lot of times people will say, you know what? Well, I would tell them. I would tell them, hey, um, there's an issue in regards to personal hygiene. But my point is this. You do not know the battles that other people are facing. Maybe they're, they're experiencing personal issues at home. Maybe they lost their house. Maybe there was a house fire. Maybe something there was something that is impacting their life in a very profound way. And you know what? They need that job. They need to show up and they need that job in order to put food on the table to support their family. Or maybe they need that job to help pull themselves up and, and get themselves into a better position. And so you don't want to offend someone, but you don't really want to hurt someone's feelings in a way that makes them self-conscious to where they quit coming to work or maybe they quit coming to school, etc. You don't want to do that. And so it has to be approached in a very sensitive way way and that's why my advice to you is that you don't say anything to them right um, maybe you say it to your boss or to the teacher or to who to whoever is the authority figure in that situation and you say that in private you definitely don't say it in front of them and you don't say it you don't bring it up in front of anyone else you go to that person in confidence and say you know I just wanted to let you know that there that this person um, has a personal hygiene issue and it is really starting to uh, impact or affect other people at work or other people in the classroom, is there something that you can say or do? 
right? So push that off. That's why someone else makes more money than you. That's why someone else is in that position. Let them be the person responsible for dealing with that. Now, if you're the boss and you're the bo- and and it's you're in the position to have to say that, then you have to be able to pull that person aside by themselves, not in front of other people, and you have to phrase that conversation in such a way that it's not offensive or personal to them, right? And so you'll see that in terms of personal hygiene come up. You also see hygiene at work in terms of um, respecting other people's space, especially with the office office refrigerator. Now, if you've ever been in an environment where there was a shared office refrigerator, you have dealt with this. People will steal your food. They will drink your sodas. They will literally take your entire lunch bag out, eat everything in it, and then put the bag, except maybe a bag of chips, and then put the bag back into the refrigerator. Now, that's pretty rude. People do that all the time. So you need to have office refrigerator etiquette. Now you also, um, there are just some general rules here. I, I, rules here. I saw this and I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, keep track of what's yours. Label your items clearly with your name so people know it's yours and that it's not community food. There are instances where people will bring, say, drinks or stuff like that, and and they'll, it'll be for everyone to share, for anyone who needs it. Um, so if it's not communal, then put your name on it. If something's there and it's spoiled, throw it away. Don't leave it in there. Don't don't dirty that space um, that other people are using. If you spill something or there's leaks, clean it up. Right? Don't leave food uncovered. No one wants to see your food just sitting there open in the refrigerator. Don't adjust the temperature or settings. Don't leave the door open. That's going to impact other people's food. And lastly, as I mentioned, just be considerate. Don't take other people's items that aren't yours. Um, so I thought that was uh, was important to, to point out. It's just one of the things that we will deal with in terms of professionalism at work. Now also, you need to understand what are the policies and procedures of your office and how tolerant um, is the organization in regards to certain rules. Um, Are there, for instance, are there policies against tardiness and how tolerant, meaning how many times can you be late before you get written up? How many times can you be written up before you're terminated? Right, so all companies are going to have these um, these things clearly laid out: the repercussions, the policies and procedures. And most oftentimes, it's going to be in the employee handbook. And I guarantee you, you've all, if you've worked, uh, you have been given access to an employee handbook, either physically or online. And I can also guarantee you that probably less than five percent of you have actually read that employee handbook. It is full of all of the policies and procedures, all of the repercussions, etc. but yet we don't take the time to read it. So take a few minutes, go through your employee handbook, especially as a new hire uh, at an organization, and read through that. Make sure if you have any questions, that's the perfect opportunity then to talk to your supervisor or go to Human Resources and say, I have some questions about the following. It's also important because it lays out what it is that you should do in terms of procedures. In the event that you have a complaint or you have a grievance or something happens at work that you need to tell someone else about. So that could be sexual harassment, that could be um, ethics violations in terms of how other people are interacting, or maybe you see someone do something that is immoral or unethical in terms of maybe they're stealing or, or whatever it may be. A lot of times companies have procedures for that, and there's a proper chain of command that you need to follow. That'll be laid out in the employee handbook. It'll say, if you have issues regarding such and such, that it is okay to go directly to human resources. You don't need to talk to your manager first. Some companies are very specific and say, you know what, you need the very first person you need to contact is your direct supervisor. And then if the problem isn't resolved, then you can then go to his supervisor and so forth and so forth. Some companies are very strict in terms of the policies and procedures Um, and you can be looked, it's frowned upon to actually skip a chain of command and go directly to someone else when you when you don't follow those proper procedures. So do take the time to look at that. Know the rules is what I call it. Um, You also see things with know the rules uh, for instance with company policies on employee dating. Some companies will say, you know what, you can date people that you work with as long as they're not your direct supervisor. Some companies will say, you know what, we don't want uh, employees dating, period. 
And generally, the rule of thumb is you probably don't want to date someone you work with because what if it doesn't work? What if you break up? What if there's conflict? Well, now all of a sudden, that conflict is now introduced into the workplace because you have to be at work with each other, uh, but yet now you don't like each other. So general rule of thumb, probably don't date people you work with, um, but companies do have specific policies that refer to that. Now we also look at elements of collegiality and collegiality is just this idea of respecting other people around us and the work that other people produce, right? Having support uh, or supporting and cooperating with other people's colleagues. And one of the cool things about this is that a person who feels appreciated will always do more than what is expected. So that's a good tip if you ever want to be a manager or be in a supervisor role, or maybe you are, is that people who feel appreciated they do more, they give back more. Also, if we help our colleagues, if we're a supportive um, coworker, those co coworkers will be there to support us when we need them. Maybe that's on a project and we need a little bit more help, um, or maybe we're just having a bad day or feeling down. They'll be there to support us if you're there to support them. So that's a collegial environment. Now moving on, my uh, next tip for you is to be a team player and to always be a team player. And that means be willing to understand and hear the ideas of others. But I also look at this in a very different way that I think was very useful for me at the beginning of my professional career. Now you'll see the happy birthday here. And what I mean by this is when you are invited to work functions, especially as a new employee, go. If someone invites you to Jerry's birthday party and you don't know who Jerry is because you've been there a month, go. It gives you the opportunity to network, but it also gives you the opportunity to show others without actually saying anything, just showing up, showing other people that you're a team player, that you're investing in your coworkers and you're investing in the organization. It says, I want to be here and I want to be here for the long term that you're building relationships. It's one of the best pieces of advice that I got from a mentor in the very early stages of my professional career, right out of college. He said, Rick, you have to show up. He says, people look and they see who's there, they see who's at these events, and if you're there, they think positively of you, and if you're not there, they're wondering, why aren't you there? Does he not does he not want to be around his coworkers? Does he not want to be here for the long term, et cetera? And I took that advice and I just started showing up. And it was amazing to me to see how people interacted with me uh, so differently just by showing up and being there. Now, my next tip for you is this, that it is okay to ask for help. One of the things, especially as new employees, that oftentimes people don't want to do is ask for help. Uh, they become overwhelmed. Maybe they don't know how to do a task appropriately. And they say, you know what? I don't want my boss to think that he hired the wrong person. I don't want my boss to think that I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And so you try to do it all on your own. And then in the end, you get over your head or maybe you even mess things up and then you have to reach out for help anyway. Uh, and sometimes it can just make the situation a lot worse. So don't be afraid to ask for help. And when you ask for help, acknowledge your appreciation. If someone goes out of their way to help you complete a task or a project, send them a thank you email. You know, send them an email that says, Rick, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, your busy day, to help me with, to help me complete uh, the report uh, due end of last week. Just say thank you because when you acknowledge people's appreciation, they're going to be much more willing to help you in the future. Also, it is important to say, uh, important to acknowledge that it's okay to say no. There will be times at work where people ask you over and over to help and to do things, and it is okay to say no that you're just overwhelmed or that you can't help in that instance. So it's, it is a two-way street there. Now, uh, we got our boss baby here. Uh, he's here because I want you to understand that it is not okay to overinflate your abilities. If people ask you to do something um, and you're not sure, don't say that you know how to do it, right? Uh, again, Remember, it's okay to say that, uh, say no, or it's okay to also say, you know, I'm not sure how to do that. 
if your boss says, hey, can you help, can you prepare uh, the report on uh, return on investment from the X project? Well, we don't like to tell our bosses no, but if you don't know how to do that or if you haven't done that before, it's okay to say, you know what, I'm, I'm really not sure how to do that. And you can follow that up with, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to do it and help, but can you point me in the direction of someone who can, who can help get me started? And your boss is going to say, well, why don't you partner with Karen? And uh, Karen's done it and she can fill you in on, on what needs to be done, right? And so uh, remember that. Know your abilities and don't be afraid to reach out for help. Now moving on along, I want to talk about recognition uh, and some key concepts here. Recognition has been proven as uh, among the best methods for improving work motivation employee engagement, right? Your boss saying, good job you, or, or great job, keep up the good work. Research suggests one minute spent on recognizing behavior equates to about 100 minutes of initiative in return. That is a pretty good, actually that's a phenomenal in return on investment there. One minute of motivating an employee can get you 100 minutes of productivity in return. However, two of three people receive no recognition in a given year. That's pretty sad. But it takes me to my next point, which is don't expect praise. That chart shows us, that graph there shows us that while people perform much better when they get praise, most people don't get praise at work, right? We're not gonna get that sticker placed on our desk like we did in elementary school. We're not gonna get that pat on the back maybe. I learned an important lesson with this. My very first job out of college, I worked with Citigroup in collections. And I was really empathic, I was a good listener. And so I would listen to people and I became a very, good collector of, of financial debt. And I quickly rose to the very top of the, of the office. Uh, within a few months, I was the number one collector in the Southeast United States. And what I found though was at the monthly meeting, my boss would, I would get a certificate and our collector of the month is Rick. That's it. That's all I'd get. He wouldn't come by my desk. He wouldn't pat me on the back. He wouldn't tell me I was doing a great job. I got a lousy certificate and then an acknowledgement in the newsletter that just had my name and what I did for the month. That was it. I remember talking to my great aunt at the time and I was complaining. I was like, I just don't understand why they don't value what I do. Why they don't appreciate what I do. And she taught me a very important lesson and she says, Rick, you got to work, you got to do your job in a way that you don't require or expect that recognition, that praise. And when you work, when you do your job in that way, it'll come back to you. And it'll come back to you tenfold. Just because someone doesn't recognize the good job that you're doing now doesn't mean that you won't be recognized for that or that it won't benefit you later. And that is so true because I went on to get a job in mortgages. And I got that job in mortgages because of the success that I had at Citigroup. I remember being in the interview and the hiring manager said, you know what, you, we're really looking for people who have experience in mortgages, but you do have a lot of success. And I said, give me the opportunity and I promise you, I'll be successful. He gave me that shot, I got the job, I was very successful. I went on to be promoted to sales manager of that organization um, after about a year and a half. Um, all because that success that I had at Citigroup paved the way for opportunities later, even though I never got any praise. So don't expect praise, but know that you will be rewarded for the hard work that you do at one point or 